Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. We are recording now at South by Southwest. We are sitting in a speakeasy on 6th Street. This, is, this place represents everything I love about South by Southwest. It is a bar. They make great cocktails. Uh, really smart people operate behind these doors. It's the huge, the digital agency, which we've covered before, um, sponsors this event. And it is behind closed doors. No one knows where it is. And you need to have a badge in order to get in. So it's, it's very very exclusive. Uh, we're lucky to shoot here. My guest, we're even more lucky because my guest is, Su is Sophie Kleber, Executive Director of Product and Innovation at HUGE. That's a big That's job. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting us here, letting us shoot here, and talking to us. Uh, we're going to talk about conversational interfaces, making smarter machines, and this bot revolution, which is basically everybody here at South by Southwest is talking about. Um, so you gave a, a, a presentation about how we can make more emotional machines. Um, what exactly does that mean, and why do we want to have more emotional machines? Right. Um, yeah, I was asked this question when you know my my talk that I proposed was, um, you know, emotionally intelligent um, man, computer or machine computer interactions. People were like, we don't even have emotionally intelligent humans, you know. So yeah. is it like the blind leading the blinder? But uh, the thing is this: um, we're kind of currently at a at a super cusp between how we interact with machines. The times of what we call the terminal world, where we interact through terminals, which we made like smaller and smaller, right? But it's really just screens. That time is over. And the interactions that we now have are becoming much more intuitive. Voice is the leading chart of it, but even the Internet of Things in which kind of, you know, computing power wraps your life and, and does things without you even like, you know, small adjustments without you consciously thinking about it. It's a very, very new world of interacting with, with machines. And the intelligence that's starting to come up as well is, um, is fascinating. And, and what we've noticed in research that we've done with people who have conversational UIs, who have like Alexa or Google, is that the moment the machine starts talking, they assume relationships. So this is not that these people say like, oh, it's now just easier. But they also assume that the machine has some sort of empathy towards them, some sort of support. So the moment to think about it is now. And the moment to think about what that means and what that personality is is now. And then there's this other field that's coming in, that's come in th since uh, 1995, invented at the MIT by Rosalind Picard, is the idea of effective computing. And that means that machines are able to um, understand, interpret, and decode emotions, and also potentially to react emotionally. So it's these two sides to it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's very, very important that we talk about it now because it's the first step into mind reading. If you see what these machines, it's a, it's a $36.4 billion industry expected to be that in 2021. So it's a massive industry of just detecting emotions. And if you see what these machines can detect, there's, there's basically three messages. There's, there's facial recognition, voice, and biometrics. And facial is the most advanced because of these micro movements that we have on, and micro expressions that we have. If you see what can be done there, it's a little bit like mind reading. And it's, it's a massive opportunity and a massive responsibility. So someone I talked to at MIT said it's like nuclear power. Like now we have to see what we do with it. And that's why we're talking about it now, because the moment is here. The intelligence is coming. The interaction models are changing. So we need to figure out, and, and people are ready for it or, or assume it naturally. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out what we do as brands and, and, and how we get into it. So It's a very, it's an interesting, I think that phrase, term, terminal-based computing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, PC Mag obviously was, you know, covered the birth of the PC industry. Yeah. We moved into the mobile space, but that was basically just a terminal that you could carry with you mm -hmm. wherever you went. Um, now that we've got Siri and Google Now, those were okay um, interfaces, but with the rise of Alexa and Google Home, you find people at home asking questions and getting into conversations, and they, they literally presume that there's some kind of emotional response. They read into it. And that's, right, that's because yeah. we were built to look for those types of responses. Yeah. I think, you know, I thought a lot about why Siri wasn't a success and Alexa is a success, and I think there's two parts to it. The first one is that Siri was built... Um, as an alternative interface to an interface that was already there. So Siri is on the phone. There's already an interface. Why would I switch it to the voice, right? Mm -hmm. And if the voice, because the voice was worse than the screen-based, it didn't kick off. Yeah. Alexa doesn't have an interface. It's just, you know, a, a puck. Mm -hmm. And 
it has only the voice interface plus Alexa is in the comfort of your home in which you have a much different understanding of privacy. It's yours and it's the idea that you're much more comfortable just talking out loud to a machine versus in public, you know, I'm not going to go like, you know, ask Siri weird, embarrassing questions. I'm amazed at how many people do that though. They yeah. do complete voice <laughs> dictation, everything on their phone right. in a crowded train. Yeah, so it's coming a little bit more and it's, it's starting to become a little bit weird because these people forget that they're not in a private space and don't understand what everyone else can hear. Mm -hmm. But um, we see how that goes. Yeah, but, but the assumption of emotions is, was pretty big because what we found in the, in the user research was from anything like assistant, you know, just doing the chores and, and, and reminding you of stuff that I can already do, over to like this one guy said like, you know, what if I could um, come home and I can unload onto my AI? Like I could like, you know, just unload what happened in the day and, and the machine is like, oh yeah, that's great. Just like, listen. Yeah, and he literally used the, say, the term instead of paying the shrink. Mm -hmm. And then we even, we asked people in an idea world, what would you describe the relationship between the machine? And they said, you know, um, from anything from assistant, friendly assistant to friend, best friend to mom. And two people had named their AIs and one had named it after their mom and the other one had named it after their child. And these are very, very personal relationships so it, it's already there and and I think when we think about what brands have to do and could do the, the first thing we need to think about is what are we trying to achieve here like are we trying to make Prozac for like in computer form mm. and I think luckily the the research field the research in in happiness has has evolved enough to understand that that's not the goal that you can't a fulfilled life, and, and Martin Zedekman calls it flourish, like a, a, a way to flourish is not just being happy. It has to do with meaning, it has to do with meaningful relationships and accomplishment. And this concept of resilience as well says, you need to be down in order to get back up and in order to feel like you have accomplished that. Mm -hmm. So emotions are complicated as fuck. Happiness is complicated. Everything is, is you know, is something that we have to be we have to be very nuanced in what we want to achieve. So if we, if we assume for a second we want to achieve flourishing, right? Then we'll have to see, okay, um, what kind of inputs do we have? And, and then what kind of ways do we have to react? So there's two parts to, uh, I developed a framework essentially, and there's two parts to the framework. The first one is, um, you know, permission to play and desire for emotion. So from a user perspective, you have to understand whether in this particular situation there's a desire for emotion. So you look at, you know, what's the user's emotional state right now? Mm -hmm. um, are they in an okay emotional state? What are their emotional ambitions? Do they want to go somewhere else from that state? What is the nature of the interaction? Is it a transaction, right? Like if I'm just transacting on American Airlines or whatever, there's no way for me to infuse emotions because it isn't in any way an interaction that that requires and requires that. I think a lot of brands get make a mistake right at that point where oh, yeah. they, they're in a, in a situation that it should be transactional and instead they're trying to have a conversation with their user and the user doesn't want to have a conversation. Right, so we see it with a conversation, conversation in your eyes a lot that things we have essentially in the last 20 years perfected the internet to be a transactional machine. If you look at all the companies that rose to power was like, you know, the Amazon, the, even the Google and, and all the travels, these are all transaction based situations. So we've perfected that. So we shouldn't mess with that. Mm -hmm. So in that framework, then you have to see whether or not there's actually a desire for emotional interaction in that. And then also look at what the user's context is. Like if we're sitting here and we're having a connection and an I already would come in and say like, you know, oh, you seem stressed, calm down. It's not, the, you know, it's not, not the right moment in time. Exactly. And then on the brand side, you'll have to, you have to think about a lot of things as well. So I think it was in, in 2014, Facebook actually conducted an experiment. Very controversial experiment. Very controversial experiment. So what they essentially did is they um, wanted to understand whether if you sh look at positive things in your newsfeed, you get happier and vice versa. If you look at negative things, you get sadder, right? So they conducted this experiment where they showed like thousands and thousands of people neutral to positive messages and vice versa, neutral to negative messages and then measured based on what they would post, the sentiment in their posts, whether they're happier or sadder. Lo and behold, of course, they were. So if you saw more negative messages, you would tend to post something more negative as well. 
problem was they did that completely without humans agreeing to it, right? They did it completely. They, they kind of fell back to their terms and conditions. They said, this is fine, but... Because they're engineers. The engineers, engineers were beta testing, and they were just A-B testing a theory. Exactly. And they collected data, and then yep. they were able, and, and it was useful data. It was useful data, but this is the danger zone that we're moving in, because if you look at it from the other side, in 2014, Facebook intentionally made thousands and thousands of people sad. And that is ethically not correct. Mm -hmm. So we are currently teetering on this edge where a couple of companies are playing with it, and you know, we see something like the Muse headband and ideas like that going into market where they say, we can measure your stress level and now we're just going to apply self-optimization gamification to it and say like, you know, you have a streak of being less stressed, but no one knows whether this is desired. So mm -hmm. you got to be very careful. You can't design what you can't understand. And cognitive interaction and, 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 and especially emotions is something that we only scratching the f surface. So every designer has to be very, very careful not to design something that we can't really understand. Um, and that, by the way, also prevents us from ever designing, or in the near future, designing ex machina, right? Like mm -hmm. we can't design a machine yet that has ambitions when we don't really understand how ambitions are formed and things like that. We can't really understand an emotional crazy manipulator when we don't understand how emotions work and, and why they work with one person and not with the other. And then, of course, there's the laws of robotics that apply as well, which the first law being, like, you know, don't harm a human being or don't, um, you know, through neglect, like, allow a human being to be harmed. So I'm not worried about the ex machina thing. I'm more worried about um, the lack of knowledge and therefore kind of like cheap tricks, like, you know, when you think about the Hershey smile machine where you're going up and, like, if you smile, you get a free Hershey's. Mm -hmm. There's something Don't Pavlovian you? about that more exactly. than anything else. We're not Pavlovian dogs, and I'm guaranteeing you this is not a genuine smile. The smile only turns genuine once you have the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're, we're turning things around in a weird way because we're, we're playing. We're trying to figure it out. And there, there's a, so I think you're right about the Hershey experiment, but there is technology that can tell whether or not that, smel that smile is genuine or not. Right. And the question is who, who's going to be allowed to get that information? Obviously, the user, it would be great. That's, right. That could be positive feedback. It could help you run your life better. But should your employer have access to that information? Should brands right. have access to that information? And then what are the rules about how, what they can do with that information? Because right now, there are yeah. basically no rules. So, you know, the, the other side, if you look at the permission to play of that framework is, um, you know, is it the right context? Do you have active permission from the user? I think at this point, the, there needs to be an active agreement that needs to be made. So I can't just go and scan you from afar and say, like, this person is happy or this person is sad or, or monitor you, you know, in terms of, of employment. Of course, it's, it's tricky because it, that environment is an owned environment and you enter, you, you actively agree into that owned environment when you sign up for a job somewhere, mm -hmm. right? They read your emails or they, they could potentially, you, you agree to that. But then what is the purpose, again, of that understanding is the purpose to you know change your 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 emotions for emotional well-being or is the purpose productivity which mm -hmm. they're not the same thing right. and especially employers sometimes try to make them the same thing because it would be beautiful if they would but they aren't um, so I think you know in that framework the other thing is does the company actually have a value proposition that allows them to play in that space right now because we're just at the cusp of research a lot of the work that's being done is being done in some sort of well-being like stress uh, weight loss or um, you know research with people who have difficulty decoding emotions so it's a very much a well-being a health kind of space situation but it's not going to stay there so what's your value proposition um, that you can play there and then do you actually have the right intelligence? Do you actually know and, and, and have the right algorithms to decode what you're seeing and then an understanding of what comes out of it? And then I think on the other side is when you look at that framework, you fill it with basically three different ways that a machine can interact. The first one is it reacts like a machine, right? It understands the, the emotional input, but it outputs like a machine. So conversational IVRs do that, right? They route you, they, they understand your stress level, but they route you to, or expedite you to a human being. So it's like a switchboard, mm -hmm. much more than anything, or safety in, in, in cars. So understanding that you're dozing off or understanding that you get angry, they react like a machine by either pulling over or stopping so the machine. Read, they can read the emotion, they can acknowledge it, and, but then they react like a machine right. instead of reacting. Exactly. 
So that's the first option. And the second option is this idea of the machine reacting like an extension of self. So there's two parts to it. The one is to make the emotions visible for the user. So it's a learning experience, right? Telling you um, your stress level is high, telling you um, your anger level is high or, or, or things like that. So that's a little bit the big hero th six idea, right? The diagnostics mm -hmm. tool where he's like, like you have mood swings and blah, blah, blah. You have puberty. So it's this idea of just kind of like exposing it, but the user is in full control of changing the emotions um, or um, acting in any way, shape or form. And this is the space that we are very comfortable in right now, but it, the space moves very, very easily into a space of empathy. And the question arises, uh, uh, would we ever be willing to pay for a service like that with the premise that this service is uniquely here for us? The service doesn't take ads, like you know, Apple isn't 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 doing ads and things like that, and and therefore we pay for it to be uniquely for us. And then the last one is the idea of reacting like a human. So that is the idea that I, as a user, enter an agreement with a machine, allowing that machine to manipulate my emotion, still, based or or with the premise of my my well-being. Um, but I actively enter into, into the agreement that this machine can manipulate the emotions. And you give it some independence. You give it some independence and you give it some permission to give you advice. And, and to steer you. To like, steer and you, you can yeah. say, you know, because I mean, I imagine that Facebook experiment was very instructive. Uh, they figured out, you know, what makes people sad, what makes people happy. I can imagine people saying, well, I'll pay an extra $5 a month for a Facebook feed that makes me happy. Right. And makes me happier. I should say. It makes me happier, exactly. So the the fears that are in there, like it's funny when you, I didn't know this, but when in the research I found when you ask Alexa um, or tell Alexa, Alexa, I'm really sad. She actually reacts like a scene from Big Hero 6. She's like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Sometimes listening to music or taking a walk or calling friends or talking to friends helps. Mm -hmm. I hope you feel better soon. So she's not qualified. This is like Google 101 research, like I found this on the internet, but people are already thinking about it. Engineers are thinking about it right now. It's not cognitive psychologists, it's not designers, it's, and it's not even like marketers, mm -hmm. but it's engineers are thinking about these kinds of things. So it, it comes very close and the idea that a machine, that you could very soon ask a machine for this type of advice is here. It's not tomorrow, this is right now. So. Do you know, are there any brands um, or companies that are, that are doing this well? that are providing a service that can, you know, in any aspect of this, of your uh, formula, is doing one of these things well? So I would say that there's a couple of companies in, because we're currently really just moving from research into, um, you know, into commercial applications, there's a, there's a few companies who do interesting things in these spaces, I would say. Um, Auto Emotive is a company that does it in the art, in the, in the driving space, in the auto space to say, okay, we're gonna detect all of these things, but when you look at it, it's still like a little bit like a, you know, wired, it looks like a physical computing experiment a little bit, but um, they're pretty well funded as a startup. Effectiva, of course, does a lot of it in the commercial space by showing people's ads and having people, you know, reading the micro expressions in that world to understand. So it's, it's market research, but it's important and interesting. There's one company, it's called SimSensei, and it looks a little bit like, you know, talking to a, um, a jokes or kind of like, you know, a sim. Mm -hmm. But the idea is this, so it's in, in um, you know, uh, PTSD treatment and things like that, especially young men, soldiers, have um, huge difficulties talking to therapists because of the stigma of like, you know, the shrink and mm -hmm. so forth. So they've developed a, a um, emotionally reacting or empathetic bot to start these conversations. And while they're saying, okay, these conversations aren't necessarily the only therapy, they're just, you know, um, uh, auxiliary to real therapy, this has a huge success with this type of target audience because they feel much more comfortable talking to a machine because they think it's just like out and over. It's like the guy in the research who's like, I talk to my bot and it's done and I'm, it's out, it's over. And there's, a, there's a, a way into something that previously many people didn't have access to or, or had a stigma around it where it actually starts being interesting. So Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Let me get to my closing questions. I asked all my guests this. Um, what trend, technolo technological trend, are you most concerned about going forward in the future? Um, I do have to say it's, it's the trend of, of understanding the emotions because um, 
Yeah, of course, because that's why I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing it, is... It, it means that you're worried, you're, you are more concerned, you're worried about this. I'm worried about this. So I think, uh, was it Yale University and, and the MIT just recently entered into a, an agreement to put $27 million aside to think about the ethics of this. Because the thing is, when you see, you know, some of these detections and see what comes out there, it is very intimate and it is very very close to mind reading. I don't know your thoughts, but I know your feelings. And there's something to that, that we have to see how we get comfortable with it. I do, however, think that there's such, there's this constant adaption curve between what technology can do and what humans want. And it's a kind of like a playing tennis, right? So something comes out in terms of a, a technology capability and we're like, okay, cool. And then at some point we're like, we toss the ball back and we're like, no, not cool, we don't wanna. And you know, I don't know, like watch screens don't pick up because it's too much, so we don't want it. Phone, that's where we're comfortable, that's all we need. Mm -hmm. So I think a similar thing is gonna happen here as well and potentially there's, a, there's an idea that with the idea of exposing these emotions, we become more in tune with them as well. Yeah. So. In, but it is also, I mean, we're talking about mind reading, but even less than mind reading, it, it could be mass manipulation technological based right. manipulation right and which it, is concerning it's concerning and if you look at the at the balance you know we're talking about 27 million here and then an expected 36 billion on the other side so this isn't necessarily this is a little bit of like chump change to put aside yeah. for the ethics of it um, but I do think that at all technological technological advances make us think and make us adapt as a human humankind in an extremely lightning speed. And I think that this is another piece of that. So in terms of positivity, positive trends, what, uh, what do you see, what trend do you think that gives you great hope and that you're really excited about? I am very excited about the idea of not having to interact with machines as a screen anymore because I do think that where we're going with conversational UIs and additional UIs and non-UIs, like truly non-UIs as well is, we are coming back to an idea of why we originally invented machines. And that is an idea to, for us as humans, have more of the thing that we value most, which is time, and be the, and live the life we want to live. And just now that we are out of this idea like of serving a machine, because we have to learn their commands, but actually having a machine listen more, we're coming closer to that original promise. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to see where that goes. Is there a uh, gadget that you use every day that's like that you were just in love with that, that changed your life? Yeah, my Philips Hue. Really? Yeah, it's so crazy. Um, so yeah, I have it at home only in one room and I love being able to wake up with a light versus waking up with a um, with an alarm, mm -hmm. which is always a horrendous sound. I love, you know, changing the moods and things like that. And I love the potential that it has as well, you know, once it's connected and once, you know, it might be able to be connected to my biometrics to just do things by itself. I think lighting is such a fantastic small mood changer and to be able to connect these things. I've heard a lot of people say that I w was very dismissive of the intelligent light bulbs because yeah. they were very expensive and I didn't oh, yeah. see the utility. Once I installed them in my house, I use them every day. Yeah, it's it, crazy. It adjusts enough. the light every day once you do it. And, um, and people don't know. It's one of those technologies. You don't know how it works until you actually install it. Yeah. And then you find a place for it in your life. Yeah. Um, if people want to find out, follow your work, find out what you're working on, uh, where can they find you online? Uh, so the best for my work is Twitter. Uh, I'm at Bibilassi, B-I-B-I-L-A-S-S-I. Um, and then, of course, at Huge Inc., we, you know, we have a um, blog where we post on, on, on Medium. It's called Magenta. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I get a real brain spark, I post it there, too. Yeah, I've read it. it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great publication. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Hey, thanks. I appreciate you taking time Amazing. out of your South by Southwest schedule. For sure, yeah. I love what you guys are doing. So Great. That's Fast Forward for today. I'm Dan Costa with PC Mag. You can get old episodes and not so old episodes of Fast Forward on PCMag.com. If you want to listen to this episode, you can find it on in all the places that fine podcasts are downloaded for free. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you in the future.